Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next session. In this session, we're going to continue with three or four questions on all ex from old exam papers on the chemical industry, just to make sure that we've got to grips with everything that I've taught you. And then we're going to start because then we've officially finished going through the curriculum. Whoop, whoop. So then we're going to start going through paper one revision, and it's from um, old exam papers. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. In fact, when I say old exam papers, the paper one that I've got my hands on, my grubby hands on, is from 2016. It's 2016 prelim paper. So um, that's what we will be doing. Okay, now, first of all, it says a synthesis of sulfuric acid is made possible by a method called the contact process. Remember, I said to you that they were sneaky. I said that what they do, which is very sneaky, is they include the contact process, the harbor process, and the ostel process in the, either the fertilizer section or in chemical equilibria or its reaction, okay? So they're very, very sneaky. So you guys have to know those three processes, even though originally they said they weren't going to be in, okay? So a flow diagram process, and this is a contact process, is shown. So they take some sulfur, they burn it in air, they form sulfur dioxide. They take some other gas and with the catalyst they react it to form sulfur trioxide. That at 400 to 500 degrees Celsius. This then is dissolved in concentrated sulfuric acid to form oleum. And then we add something to get con back to concentrated sulfuric acid. Okay, so it says name gas A. So we're taking sulfur dioxide and changing it to sulfur trioxide. We're going from SO2 and we're ending up with SO3. So what could we possibly adding? We have to be adding oxygen. No, I know that's not balanced, but they said name the gas and the gas is obviously oxygen. Okay, and again, they've said name the catalyst B. Remember I said to you yesterday, you have to be very careful about whether you're naming things or whether they've asked you for the formula or either or, okay? If they said name and you give the, cat the, the formula, you're not going to get the marks. So name the catalyst. The catalyst in the contact process is vanadium pentoxide. Okay, liquid C. What do we need to do to add, what do we need to add to oleum to get back to concentrated sulfuric acid? It is water, water. We need to add water to the oleum. The reason they do this is because um, oleum is a much more stable compound than your sulfuric acid. So they actually keep this in the form of oleum, which is H2S207. And then what happens is when, for example, I've told you this already, when I, I phone up and I say, hey, I'd like a liter of sulfuric acid or 10 liters or whatever, then what they do is they um, react it with water, form concentrated sulfuric acid, and then send it to me. Then it says sulfur trioxide reacts with water to form sulfuric acid. Explain what is never done in that way. Oh, I've just explained it. Okay, <laughs> there we go. I've just explained it. Now it says, write down a balanced chemical reaction to illustrate how concentrated sulfuric acid is formed from oleum. So oleum is H2S2O7. It reacts with water to form sulfuric acid, which is h 2 SO4. So obviously we need to balance this. There are two hydrogens here and two which makes four. So now we need to double that up to make that a two. Sure, it's going to take a while. Um, and then what happens is we now have two sulfurs. Okay, it's two sulfurs. And we now have eight oxygens and we've got eight oxygens. Nope, didn't take a while at all. There's your balance equation. Okay. Then it says, one of the main uses of ammonia is to manufacture nitrogenous fertilizers such as ammonium sulfate. Name the substance that is used to neutralize ammonia to make this fertilizer. In other words, I want to know what do we need to add to ammonia to get to ammonium sulfate? Ammonium sulfate. Well, it's pretty obvious that we need to add sulfuric acid. If you think about this, ammonium sulfate, the formula for this is NH4 
SO4. So what do we need to add? We obviously need to add a hydrogen and a sulfate. And the thing that we need to do is to add sulfuric acid H to SO4. And now again, they want us to write a balance equation to show this reaction mentioned in this question takes place. So we're going to take our ammonia and we're going to add our sulfuric acid. And then we're going to end up with NH4 SO4. I just have to think about this because um, ammonia is NH4 plus and sulfate is SO4 to minus. So in fact, that has to have a two there. So yeah, let me just fix that. Um, that has to be fixed. So that goes to, it's the wrong red, it doesn't matter, to SO4. Let me explain this to you. Sulfate, if you think about it, sulfuric acid formula, is H2SO4, right? So that means it breaks up sulfuric acid, H2SO4, breaks up into 2H plus, plus SO4 to minus. The formula for ammonium is NH4 plus. So we need two of these to react with one sulfate. So that's the overall for formula now. So now, do you see we need two nitrogens on the left-hand side to make this work? So we need two here. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? It means we've got six, seven, eight hydrogens. We've got eight hydrogens there. Four times two is eight. We've got one sulfur here, one sulfur here. And we've got four oxygens, four oxygens. Done. We balanced. Yay. Okay. Not too bad, eh? But do you see how little of it is about <laughs> fertilizers and how much of it is about your processes. Let's look at this question. It says the following, the flow diagram below shows three steps of the industrial preparation of fertilizer. We've got a hydrogen and nitrogen, which join together through a process to form compound A, which is then added to nitric acid to form a fertilizer. Next thing, first thing they say, name the compound A. Well, the first thing you need to realize is that hydrogen and nitrogen join together to form ammonia. Ammonia. Then it says name or formula of the catalyst let used in step Q. Okay, so now we're going from ammonia, NH3, to nitric acid. So what process is this? This is the Ostwald process, the Ostwald process. And what is the catalyst for Ostwald process? It is iron, Fe. Okay, please remember that you need to learn your catalysts. What is the source of hydrogen used in step P? Where do we get this hydrogen from? It's from your Sassel um, syngas process, syngas process. You could also say your source of air was from fossil fuels. You're welcome to say it is from fossil fuels. It's all correct. Okay, now it says in step R, compound A, which we said was ammonia, reacts with nitric acid to form fertilizer T. Write down the name or formula of fertilizer T. Okay, so we're taking ammonia and we're adding nitric acid, so we're going to end up with ammonium nitrate, ammonium nitrate, okay, or if you need to, it's NH4NO3, yeah. The reaction ammonia plus six NOs gives you nitrogen plus water is a secondary reaction that takes place in the first stage of process Q. Explain in detail why the secondary reaction is undesirable. The reason it's undesirable is because it is giving off nitrogen. And we do not want to give off nitrogen and we do not want to use up our NO because the NO is used in the second stage of the process of Q. Okay, the main reason we don't want this is besides the giving up, giving off of nitrogen, is that it's using up our NO. Because normally what happens is we end up using the NO in the second stage to form our nitric acid. Okay, so 
you really don't want that at all because yeah, you're using it up. Um, see, there you're using your NO to form plus the water plus the oxygen to form nitric acid. So if yeah, you're using your NO to form nitrogen, you are losing that NO. In one of the steps of the acyl process, the following reaction takes place. 4NO plus 2H2O plus 3 oxygen gives you 4HNO3. It says calculate the maximum mass of nitric acid, which can be made from 720 decimeters cubed of nitrogen 2 oxide, which is your NO, at room temperature. Assume the molar gas volume at room temperature is 24 decimeters cubed. Okay, so they're being sneaky here, they're being really sneaky because even though this is actually part of a question that came from the fertilizer section and what they've done is they've included stoichiometry, okay? What they've said is we've got 4NO gas plus 2H2O liquid plus 3O2 gas is giving us 4HNO3 aqua. Okay, and they say they want to know the maximum mass that we can get of this stuff if we're given 720 decimeters cubed of this stuff. But they give you a hint and they tell you that the molar gas volume, they want you to assume it's 24 decimeters cubed. Normally it's 22.4, but in this case they're saying assume that it's 24 decimeters cubed. So do you agree that no matter what, I don't care that they've asked you to work out mass, we always have to work in moles. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide this by 24 to find the number of moles. Okay, so let's do that. And where's my calculator gone? Oh, let me just dig out the calculator quickly. I don't know where it went. Oh, shush. There we go. So we're going 720 divided by 24 equals 30. So we've got 30 moles of NO. That's what we've actually got. But our recipe says, our theoretical equation says, 4 moles of NO is going to make 4 moles of HNO3. Therefore, 30 moles of NO is going to make 30 moles of HNO3. Now we need to find the mass. So we know that number of moles is mass over molar mass, right? So therefore the mass is equal to number of moles times the molar mass. The number of moles is 30. The molar mass of ammonia is hydrogen, which is 1, nitrogen, which is 14, plus 3 times 16 for the oxygen. Okay, so let's pop that into our calculator and see what we get. So let's do it. 3 times 16 plus 15 times by 30, which is 1890. So we have got 1890 grams. Okay, so the maximum mass of nitric acid that can be produced from 720 decimeters cubed of nitrogen monoxide is 1,890 grams. Right, cool. Right, so let's now start on physics, okay? So I know it's a bit of a mission to get your head around the fact that we're now moving back to physics, but I think it's important that we start revising immediately. Okay, so I've missed out the multiple choice or multiple guess questions um, because of the fact that it takes quite a while to go through them, um, but closer to the time I will go through them. Okay, right, so it says, first let me change color so that I can on this thing. So it says, a man applies a constant pulling force on a heavy parcel of mass 50 kgs using a light inextensible rope 
which passes of a light frictionless pulley as shown in the diagram. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that it's not going to stretch, which is great. That inextensible means it's not stretchy. And it's a light frictionless pulley. That means that the pulley is not providing any forces or anything on it. The coefficient of static friction between the parcel and the rough table surface is 0.34. So there's a coefficient of static friction of 0.34. They also tell you the maximum, the maximum frictional force is 120 newtons. That's what they say. And it says ignore the mass of the rope. Okay, firstly then it says draw a free body diagram showing all the forces acting on the parcel. All the forces acting on the parcel. Okay. So let's just have a look at this. The man applies a constant pulling force on the heavy using a light. Okay. So first of all, the free body diagram has to include has to include the fact that it's a dot colored in circle. Okay. Free body diagram has to include that it is a circle. There is obviously a force of gravity down. Force of gravity down. Right, there is obviously, yeah, this is the tension in this rope. Okay, I'm sorry, it's not quite at the right angle. There is obviously a force of friction going this way because I'm assuming that this is going to move this way since the man is pulling it. So that's the force of friction. And then there is a normal force upwards because the fact that the table is holding this parcel up. Okay, so there is a normal force up, if normal. The table is holding this parcel up. Next it states, it says state in words Newton's second law of motion and grade 12s, I seriously like what would like to urge you to try and get your hands on um, a thing called the exam guidelines. The exam guidelines. You can just Google it, okay, or ask your teachers for it. They should have given it to you by now. The reason being in the exam guidelines are all the official definitions of everything you need to know. And guys, you need to learn your definitions. Up to 10% of the paper, at least up to 10% of the paper, um, is usually definitions. So please go learn your definitions. So Newton's law, second law in motion, is basically F net equals MA, but if you just write that, you're not going to get the marks. So what does it say? It says, when a resultant force acts on an object, the object will accelerate with an acceleration that is directly proportional to the resultant force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Okay, now it says, when the static frictional force is at its maximum, which is 120 newtons, show that the magnitude of the vertical component of the tension force in the rope is 137,06 newtons. Okay, it says, when the static frictional force is at its maximum, show that the magnitude of the vertical component of the tension force in the rope is 137.06 newtons. So let's finish this drawing, okay? So let's draw it back into the thing, okay? So because there is a maximum frictional force, this is obviously being pulled this way. So there is going to be a horizontal component and a vertical component, right? And this horizontal component is 120 newtons. And when they say that the frictional force is 120 newtons, it means that the horizontal component of this has also got to be 120 newtons. Sorry, I'm just reading for a second. Because I'll tell you why. 
if you think about it, if the maximum static frictional force is being applied, then this is going to be equal to this because the object is not going to move in the horizontal component, okay? So therefore we can say, well, then obviously these two are equal, okay? These two are equal and they match, right? So now we can look at the maximum tension, okay? So we know that the force of gravity is going to be 50 times by 9,8. So if I find that out, this is going to be 50 times 9.8, which is 490 newtons. So that's 490 newtons. So you've got 490 newtons pulling it down, okay? And now when they want to know what is the maximum tension in this rope, okay? So, do you agree that if that's the case, then we have a triangle that looks like this, where this is 490, this is equal to 120, and we want to know what, I can't be right. Sorry, I'm just getting a little bit blank here. I don't think I've got enough information. So the man's constant pulling force on a heavy parcel mass 50 years in the light and extends with which parts of a light friction is pulley as shown. And the coefficient of steady friction under the rough surface is 0.34. Oh, I'm being an idiot. Okay, sorry, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, because I haven't taken into account the normal force. Okay, do you agree that the force of friction is equal to mu k f n? Okay, we know that the force of friction is 120. We know that the mu k is 0.34. So therefore we can work out what Fn is, okay? So therefore we're gonna divide Fn, I mean both sides by 0.34, 0.34 and 0.34 get rid of that, so therefore Fn is equal to, let's just work that out, it's 120 divided by 0.34 equals 352,94. That's 352,94. So Fn is 352,94. So what do we have now? We now know that the vertical component, this vertical component of the rope has to be equal to the vertical component of the rope, that's a rope vertical, plus the F normal has to cancel out the force of gravity. Okay, now we know that the force of gravity is 490. We've just worked out that the F normal is 352,94. So therefore we can find the vertical component of the rope because they have to cancel each other out. So we can go 490 minus 352.94 equals 137.06 newtons, 137,06 newtons. So there we go. We've got worked out the vertical component of the tension, the string. Okay, now it says, sorry for the, having the blonde moment. It says, hence determine the angle theta that the rope forms with the horizontal as well as the magnitude of the tension force in the rope. Okay, so now, now, now we have a triangle that is saying that we have got the horizontal component of the triangle and we've got the vertical component of the triangle. We have got the horizontal, we're basically looking at this triangle here, this one here, okay? So we've got the horizontal component of the triangle, which we said was 120. We've got the vertical component, which is 137,06. And they want this angle theta and the tension. I know they said yeah, and and 
as well as the magnitude of tension force in the rope. And over here, it's labeled here. But this is all the same rope. And therefore, this tension here is exactly the same as that tension there. So all we have to do is use trig to get theta. And then we can either use Pythagoras or trig to get the tension. So let us use Sarkatoa. Do you agree that this is the upper side and this opposite side and this is the adjacent side of the angle? So we're going to use tan. So we're going to go tan theta is equal to 137,06 over 120. So theta is going to be second function tan of 137,06 over 120. So grade 12, what you need to realize here is that even if you couldn't prove this, you can still use this value over here. Hence the word hence. And another thing grade 12 that you need to realize is that they've given you the value of 137.06. So even if you've worked something out, and you worked out the vertical, say you worked out the vertical component of the tension of force, but you worked that to be, I don't know, 246 for some reason. Don't go use your 246. Use what they gave you for the rest of the question. I know that a few years ago, um, several years ago now actually, there was an error in one of the exam papers. I think it was an IB grade 12 exam paper where the number was wrong. You need to use what they gave you in the rest of the question. They will allow for it, okay? So please don't panic about that. Right, now, so let's use our calculator for this. So we're going to go divided by, no, yeah, divided by 120 equals, and then I'm going to go shift tan of the answer equals 48.796, so it rounds it up to 48.8. So therefore, theta is equal to 48,8 degrees. So this theta here is 48,8 degrees. Yay! So that's angle theta. Now, we're going to get tension. I personally will well, it actually doesn't matter whether you use the angle or what, because it's all worked out together. So it really doesn't matter if you use Pythagoras or if you use trig. Um, I'm going to use trig. So I'm going to use, we know that this angle now is 48,8 degrees. And we were given both sides. So actually, you know what? I would actually go back to using Pythagoras. I just realized why. I worked out this angle, but they gave me this and they gave me the 120. So it's safer to work out this tension using the numbers they gave me than to work using the angle that I worked out that may be wrong. Okay. So T equals the square root of 137,06 all squared plus 120 squared. Okay, just using Pythagoras. So let's find that out. So let's clear it. So we're going to go square root of 137.06 squared plus 120 squared equals 182.1 Remember, you always look at the third number to round. So it's 182.17. So it's 182,17. And what is it? It's tension. So it's newtons. Newtons. Okay. Right. Now, it says a man increases the magnitude of his pulling force under the action of the new force the parcel begins to slide horizontally along the table. So yay, the man is now pulling, he's pulling hard, okay? And because he's pulling hard, the parcel is starting to slide this way. It says, how will the magnitude of the normal force change as the parcel slides across the table surface? State only increases, decreases, or remains the same. Okay, 
how will the magnitude of the normal force change as the parcel slides? Okay, so let's think about it. At the moment, the parcel is over here, and this is the tension, and this angle here is 48,8 degrees. Okay, and this is what's making it up, and the normal, so to get force of gravity, here's the force of gravity, right? Then we've got F normal, and we've got the horizontal component of the tension. They add up to form force of gravity, okay? Now, this slides closer. So if it slides closer, let's put it over here. Hang on, let's put it over here. If it slides closer, what happens to this angle? Do you see that this angle gets sharper? Okay, so if the angle gets sharper, okay, what is going to happen to my vertical component of my, of my force? My vertical component of my, why is this H? The vertical component of the tension is going to get bigger, okay? So if the vertical component of the tension is getting bigger, what is happening to the normal force? The normal force is going to decrease because they both have to add up to the force of gravity. So therefore, we can say the normal force is going to decrease. And why? Because the vertical component of the tension is going to get bigger and bigger. And therefore, it's going to take, and these two have to add up to become the, to be equal to the force of gravity. Okay, right, next question. A girl is playing in a bedroom with a super bouncy ball, which has a mass of 50 grams. The girl throws the super bouncy ball straight down towards the ground from an unknown height to edge. Okay. Unknown height to edge. Oh, there it is. Straight down. It hits the ground with a speed of three meters. Okay, no. She throws it down with an initial speed. So this is VI of three meters per second. It hits the ground and bounces straight up past her to a maximum height, 0.6 seconds after bouncing. Ignore the effects of air friction. Then it says, calculate the speed with which the ball leaves the floor after bouncing. Okay, okay. so this is obviously vertical projectile motion, right? So our formulas are, okay, first of all, let's just talk about what we want. We wanna know what is the velocity with which it bounces up. So what we're going to be doing is looking at this motion here, the up motion. Okay, the up motion. I'm going to choose down as positive. It doesn't matter what you do, choose, but you need to always tell the teacher what you're choosing, okay? So I'm choosing down as positive. My V initial for this bit is what we're trying to find out, okay? My V final is zero. At this point where it reaches its maximum height, my final velocity is zero. Do you agree? Do you agree the acceleration, since I've chosen down as positive, is going to be 9,8 meters per second squared. You don't need to find it in units. And delta T is 0, 0,6 seconds. The time taken is 0, 0.6 seconds. And I want to know what is that initial velocity. So my equations of motion are Vf is equal to Vi plus A delta T. That works. That works. I've got the Vf. I've got the A. I've got the delta T. I want Vi. Yay, problem solved. So we can say 0 is equal to Vi plus 9,8 multiplied by 0, 0,6. Okay, so therefore, VI is equal to negative 9.8 multiplied by 0, 0,6 equals 5,88. So it's minus 5,88 meters per second. Yes, okay, that makes sense. So that is my, so what is the speed? It asks for the speed, so it's just 5,88 meters per second because speed is a scalar. So let's write it down. 5,88 meters per second. Now it says a ball loses 5% of its kinetic energy during each bounce. Calculate the kinetic energy of the ball just before its first bounce. 
Okay, so in other words, it's saying that this is the equivalent of 95% of the kinetic energy. That's the equivalent, that velocity there matches 95% of the kinetic energy. Okay, so what we need to do is first find out what the kinetic energy is and then work out what 100% would have been. Okay, so let's do that. So do you see that this is a nice question because not only is it combining, this we use graphs, I mean equations of motion. Now we're using energy and energy principles and over here we're gonna do a position versus time graph. So it's a very nice question that combines a whole bunch of things. Okay, so let's do that. So then kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared. Now they told us the mass of the ball, it's 50 grams. But what's wrong with that mass? The mass has to be in kilograms. So you've got to go 50 divided by 1,000, which is 0, 0, 0,05 grams, right? 0, 0.05 grams. So that's a half times 0, 0, 0,05 times the velocity of 5.88 squared. Okay, so now let's get our calculator. So you've got 5.88 squared times 0 0.05 times 0 0.5 equals 0, 0.86 joules. So it's 0, 0.86 joules. I just want to check that. Um, yeah, 5.8. Let me just check that, okay? So let's just clear it. So we're going to go 0 0.5 times 0 0.05 times bracket 5.88 bracket squared equals, oh yes, that's right. Okay, so that's the kinetic energy at this point, 0, 0.86 joules. Now they want the kinetic energy at this point, but this is equal to 95 over 100, okay? So how do we get 100? We're gonna take this and multiply it by 100 and divide by 95. Okay, so in other words, what we're saying is if this is 95% out of 100, I want 100%. So I'm going to take my 0, 0,86 and I'm going to times it by 100 over 95. Effectively, what I'm doing is I'm taking this 0, 0,86 and divide by 95 to find out what one percentage is, and then I'm multiplying it by 100 to get 100%. Okay, do you understand? So let's do that. So we got 0, 0.86 multiplied by 100 equals, divided by 95, oopsie, 95, equals 0 0.91. So the kinetic energy here is 0 0.91 joules. There we go. Done, 0 0.91 joules. Now it says, using energy principles, determine the height from which the girl threw the ball. Okay. So what we are looking at is conservation of mechanical energy, which says that the total mechanical energy at the top has to equal the total mechanical energy at the bottom, assuming there is no energy loss due to friction, noise, et cetera, et cetera. And they haven't mentioned any energy being lost to friction. So therefore we can assume that there's total conservation of energy, right? So therefore, we can assume that emic at the top equals emic at the bottom because they haven't mentioned it. So emic at the top is going to be EP. Uh, you guys, you U plus K at the top has to equal U plus K at the bottom. In other words, potential energy plus kinetic energy at the top has to equal potential energy plus kinetic energy at the bottom. Okay, so therefore we've got mgh plus a half mv squared is equal to, there is no potential energy at the bottom, and we've already worked out the kinetic energy is 0, 0,91. Okay, so the mass of this ball is 0, 0, 0,05 times by gravity, which is 9,8h, plus a half times the mass, which is 0, 0,05, plus the velocity, which is 9, is equal to 0, 0,91.
Okay. So now we're going to solve for this. We're going to say 0, 0, 5 times 9,8h is going to be 0, 0,91 minus a half times 0, 0, 5 times 9. Okay, so let's do that bit first. So we're going to go 0 0.91 minus bracket. Uh, it's, the reason it's 9 is because it's 3 squared, okay? So it's 0 0.5 times 0 0.05, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 times 9 equals, okay? And then we're going to divide by these two. So we're going to divide by bracket 0 0.05 times 9.8, no, delete, 0.8, close bracket, equals 1,397, so it's 1,4. So the height is 1,4 meters. So therefore, she dropped the ball from a height of 1,4 meters. Okay, so grade 12, so that's it for today. We will continue going through revision papers um, on Monday. Um, we will finish going through this pay physics paper and then we'll do chemistry papers, etc., etc. If you have any queries about any specific section, please do not hesitate to contact us and we will go through those sections. Have a great day.